next is uh, Chad Finn is going to talk about uh, black raspberry something. <laughs> Last so I'm just taking it over, so I'm not self-conscious about it. Yes, that's blackberry. I flicked it right under my shirt on the last spoon. Did not dribble out of my mouth there. Not that much of a squat. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about black raspberries and sort of give you an overview of where we've gone over the last uh, 15 years of black raspberries. A number of years ago, we started... I mean, it's been a, not a one-year thing where it popped up, but we used to have black caps fields that were healthy and vigorous and lived for, you know, there were probably 20-year-old fields at some time, and by the time probably the 70s or 80s rolled around, you probably had 10-year-old fields. So by the time somewhere in the 80s or 90s, especially if you're in some of the areas where there's a lot of black raspberries grown, you're down to where fields are lasting two or three years. Now, some people have beat this problem by finding some really isolated locations out of state, way far away from where the black raspberries are grown. But it's still a very big problem for local black raspberry producers, or, or black raspberry producers here in the valley. So sort of, we started really working, I guess, in 1998. We're going to go, I'm going to go through each of these. It's all, it's all very pretty informal. Uh, been talk, you know, we started off by trialing all the known cultivars. Then we looked to see if there's any variability to make improvements from breeding. We did some germplasm collection. We started evaluating variability, especially for uh, aphids and verticillium and chemistry. We're still ongoing with that. And uh, look at, I'll talk a little bit about molecular markers, <coughs> chemistry, fingerprints, and back to breeding. And we'll back up real fast. I mean, there, there's no one cause for this. Certainly, one of the more recent problems has been the aphid vector black raspberry necrosis <coughs> virus. That's a big chunk of what's going on. Verticillium will also take these out. Root rot will take these out. A hard winter on top of root rot will really take them out. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on, but certainly one of them is the aphid problem in verticillium, and we could also have some infractions. So we started off uh, back, what was it, 1999, we planted every single black raspberry we could get a hold of. We went to the repository, we went to all the nurseries, we got this big, large group just to try to see if anything did better or as well as munger. And uh, pretty much everything went down pretty fast, and we sort of took the top half of the planting, the ones that had performed with higher yields, and, and kept moving with those. First thing we did is, just like any good breeders, we sort of crossed them, and not all possible combinations, but many possible combinations. I will point out that we had this NC8410-3, which is a selection from near the Rocky Mountain, excuse me, not the Rocky Mountain, Smoky Mountains in North Carolina, and Rubus lupidermis, which is our native black raspberry. They were included in this uh, mix. And this is when Michael Dossett did his master thesis. He's currently the breeder with Ag Canada on uh, raspberries and strawberries. And you know, we did things like calculate trait variability, you know, how when you make crosses, what, what gains would you expect from selection, and trying to figure out which cultivars would be good as parents. We looked at a lot of different traits. Like the wheat, this is the royal wheat. Michael went out there and looked at a lot of traits, whether it was flowering time. Uh, fruit size, fruit color. He did some chemistry work with Jung Min Lee and Anthony Sign in chemistry from the USDA based in Parma, Idaho. And they saw there's some variability. You know, these each represent populations. So 3017 is represented by whatever, 28 plants out in the field. So each of these are probably 28 plants and came from a family. So imagine all your siblings being planted in one field and seeing how they react to things. That's what's going on here. And we did it for a lot of traits. This happened to be for bigger, we saw some differences. Some things performed very poorly and some things performed better. Um, you know, and sort of, you know, we targeted some things at the top and, you know, looked at some of these populations. What were these populations over here? What, what did they give us and, and where did they come from? Whoops. And basically we looked over it all. We figured out that black raspberries pretty much have a very generic genetic base. And Michael's going to go on to confirm this in his PhD, but from his master's and from looking at other research, it pretty much figured out that every single black raspberry cultivar we had tested seemed to be pretty closely related. It was either the same thing, or maybe a munger had been planted and a bird had carried it to the fence row, and uh, you know, it was a munger offspring crossed with who knows what, but then somebody said, looked at it in the fence row and said, hey, that looks beautiful, and then started propagating it, and that became a new variety, but it was obviously still very closely related to the munger, or whatever variety. So everything was pretty closely related. Um, 
did look like things like Rubus leucodermis, which is the native species, might be useful breeding, increasing our variability. We did think we could make progress in breeding, which is promising, but we didn't have much of a genetic base to work from. And really, the, some of the things that seemed most promising really related back to this North Carolina selection. It, was, uh, it gave us a lot of variability for a lot of different traits, which the more variability you have, the more likely you are to be able to make improvements, and you select for the best. So it was you know, a pretty easy argument to make that we needed more germplasm to be used to pull in our breeding program. So in some parts, if any of you who regularly attend these meetings, you've seen parts of all this story over time. Michael went out and, uh, well, first of all, he called all of his friends and my friends, and we all said, you know, black raspberry is pretty easy to figure out. We said, could you go out and collect some fruit for us? And we got samples from all these locations, and then we went out with a trip that was sponsored by the USDA to collect along the southern edge of the range and this edge of the range. Kim Hummer went with Michael from the, Kim Hummer from the repository, went with Michael on this part of the range, and I went with Michael on this part of the range, and the rest was sent in to us. And we ended up with, I think, 100 and, I think probably 175 dots up there. So we got 175 different black raspberry populations from around the country. Um, collected from all different environments. You know, this is the sand hills of uh, northern Nebraska. I, was, I showed this slide before, but I always loved that sign, Cody. It's a town too tough to die. Um, but, you know, we collected them from more, you know, where they're just hanging on as the light's going down to better locations. We brought them back, threw them all out. First thing Michael did, I'm not exactly sure what triggered this, but uh, he wanted to be screening for aphids. This was fantastic. Here's Munger with aphids. And remember that that virus has become at least part of the whole picture as an aphid transmitted virus. And there's Munger, and boy, do aphids love to grow on that. Well, Michael tortured plants. He put, he would go through, he's a very patient guy, but three aphids on every single plant every five days. They ran away, he'd come back five days later, put three more on. And he did that for about uh, three rounds. And the ones that aphids left, he identified as aphid resistant. And he um, then went on to even do things like cage aphids in little cages on the leaves with these resistant types. And lo and behold, he'd come back later and the aphids jumped off and died versus feeding. You know, he'd done it to Munger and he knew that in these cages weren't the problem. It was, so we have pretty good sources of aphid resistance. And he was, the other good thing is he was able to identify aphid resistance from um, Maine, Ontario, Michigan, it's almost all the same latitude, right? It's sort of like that, whatever that is. And then there was one in, I think, South Dakota. But the one in South Dakota, which we used it further on, it, everything we got from it was sterile, so it's been not a good use of, not a, a good source of resistance. So we have these different sources of resistance that uh, we'd like to work with. At the same time, we, you know, after we had screened all these, we put them out in the field, we evaluated them for fruiting time, fruit size, uh, you know, fruit color, uh, fertility, you know, how many, how well set the fruit were, all sorts of traits over time. And we did start to see some differences. It's not obvious from this picture, but there were a couple populations. We started to get verticillium in the field, and there were two populations, one from Rich Mountain, South Carolina, and the other from somewhere in Georgia. And these things just continuously stood up, and, did, and they didn't have any problems with whatever our cane diseases were. So we think we have good sources of resistance for verticillium as well. Michael started some of this molecular work. It's not GMO kind of work, but the idea was to try to begin to understand whether we could identify the aphid resistance, for instance, using genetic tool, or excuse me, molecular tools versus having to go through all the trouble of screening. And especially if you have three sources of aphid resistance, in the, uh, anybody who's been around raspberries, you know that one source of aphid resistance lasts, the aphids figure that out, so to speak, in you know, five to 10, maybe 15 years. Put two sources of aphid resistance that are different into the same plant, and it may take 25 to a long, long time for the plant, for the evolution to go on and get selection for overcoming that resistance. If you put three sources of resistance in there, that should really last a long time. But for me as a breeder, I put aphids on a plant, I can't tell whether it's resistant to one, resistant to two, resistant to three, resistant to one, it has one and two in there, or two and three in there, or one, two and three in there. And so we need these molecular tools to be able to go in there and say, okay, this plant's only got source one, and this one's got both of them, and this one has all three of them. And so that's one of the places we're at, starting from sort of the end of Michael's master's thesis and feeding into some of his PhD and some of our, well actually this is part of his PhD work. PhD work feeding into our 
Specialty Crop Research Initiative grant, which I'll talk about a little bit, which Jill, for those of you who were at the uh, Cambridge Commission meeting in December, Jill talked about. The other thing that Michael Frank figured out that we sort of already knew, but he confirmed it, is up this, that little word says cultivars. This is a measure of the diversity, how related things are. This is all the different populations we collected. And lo and behold, the cultivars ended up in one spot, pretty much. So that means that all this stuff is just really distantly related to, very different from the whole. So it has, but, we, but he also did sort of find, quote unquote, it's not surprising, the cultivar genes. I mean, almost everything that's out here had fruit that was at most, you know, 80% the size of munger or something. They were never as big. Um, first year, it sometimes weren't as burly, but usually they, they took off pretty well. So there's, you know, obviously you have great deal of variability out there. This is what he's ongoing with, and I won't go into any details because it hasn't really been published. This is just a, uh, a mock-up graph of what he's pre preparing to publish. But he's looking at just, you know, how did all these different populations, how related and unrelated they were, you know, which is going to, this kind of information doesn't have anything to do with growing them. But this is going to hopefully give me information about which, you know, should I take stuff from Tennessee? Is that, you know, is the Tennessee population the most interesting ones to work with? Should I be crossing? Something from Tennessee with something from Maine, what makes the most sense? That's gonna, this kind of information will probably do that. So this sort of all led, Michael did all this great work, and, uh, and I think I'll talk about it later, but if not, I'll come back to it. We we're talking about the fingerprinting of uh, different cultivars that Michael did that was valuable. But, you know, this sort of led into our Specialty Crop Research Initiative grant, SCRI grant, that, oops, that uh, we've been working on. And I'm gonna focus mostly on the plant breeding. Jill talked more about the molecular and the genomics, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to pretty much leave all this stuff off, although this is a big part of the project, just not enough time to talk about it all. A lot of people involved in this project. To make these SCRI projects work, you need to get uh, industry support, you need to get, you have to match the funding by half from some sources other than the grant. And so we have people involved. Most of these are, you know, a mixture of breeders. In the case of breeders, we have somebody from New York, North Carolina, Ohio, and here. And that's pretty much all the breeders. Uh, and even some of the breeders don't work that much on breeding. I don't, you know, North Carolina might start breeding black raspberries if they can find something to live in their climate. Um, but then there's also people doing all sorts of different uh, aspects related uh, from uh, genomics as well as chemistry. We also have participants who are growers. We had four, we have four growers from Oregon, one from Washington, and then one near each of the eastern locations. We don't have anything in Ohio, but we do have the North Carolina and New York. What we did at these locations, and I think I'll probably, oh, well, let me go a slide. But we want to do, first of all, identify genetic diversity, start working on breeding for acre resistance, and develop cultivars that will work through the fresh market or processing. So we started with some acre resistant population. Uh, they were crossed with checks, which were jewel. They're supposed to be jewel or blackhawk. But as we found out later from a lot of the fingerprinting work, is there's a lot of Jewel and Blackhawk that were the same. Jewel and Blackhawk probably are the same anymore, just like Munger and Bristol and Cumberland are all the same. And I'll talk about those that a little bit. But we took the two of the progenies for these, and these are called mapping populations. When we do these mapping populations, we may be lucky enough to get a cultivar out of there. What we're really hoping for is getting a lot of diversity. We hope things die and live really well and have bigger fruit and have smaller fruit. But by putting them in these different locations, we'll see how they do. And the reason we wanted to involve the growers is, you know, we're going to do some sort of, we want to see, first of all, planting them on sites where there's a lot of disease pressure for black raspberry diseases and insects, and see how they respond to that. But also, um, you know, we have one site in eastern Washington. That's very cold, much colder, not much cold, colder than here. It's also, a lot of those sites around Prosser are just old mint fields. So there's a lot of Versilium over there. So we're hoping that we won't kill the entire population over there. We'll only kill about a third of it. We'll identify which ones are most resistant to Versilium. So we have those kind of, and then, you know, the population in North Carolina, <coughs> if we find anything that will take the heat better than, you know, everything sticks when it goes over, you know, 95 degrees here. Maybe we can find something based on North Carolina that doesn't have that problem. So then we take all that, um, you know, this is the sites, we take all that, uh, we call it phenotypic information, and then at the same time, the genetic people, genetics people, Jill particularly, take the ground up leaf tissue of each of those plants and feeds it into this machine that tells you what the genetic code is there, basically. 
And then you sit there and go, okay, these five plants that were verticillin resistant, they all have, I'm getting ahead of myself, they all, let's say, have a marker at this 35 spot. So we know that we don't have to screen for verticillin. We can go and grind up parents, the tissue of parents or the offspring, and feed them through this machine, and all the ones that spit out that gene or that location, that marker, should have verticillin resistance. Make it sound a lot easier than it is, but it's a huge one of this, this whole field of genomics has been completely built on, in part, this huge ability to do computational biology, you know, where you're getting these supercomputers or high powered computers to crunch through huge numbers of numbers, huge no amount of numbers to come out with this information. So that's the goal, and it's really we want to use this, particularly right away, for the aphid resistance we have. So we can say, okay, you know, the, parent, par the parents I'm going to use have. You know, based on having a marker down here and a marker here and a marker here, are likely to have aphid resistance. So that's how we're using the genomic side of it. To back up a little bit, these populations we've planted out in these grower fields, there may be something in there that we think is awesome. That's a, a seedling that can make a selection. But there's also a chance that all not be dogs. There just may not be any cultivars in there. It's more we're looking for variability, and we're not sure that anything in that group of 200 is going to have the entire package. Yeah, so we mentioned, uh, you know, just Jill Sly talking about looking for markers. And we've gotten a great deal of support from a lot of different people, including the commissions. Um, so I, we keep trying to harp on the fact we are very appreciative of that help. So that's sort of where we are in the molecular genetics. And there's other issues that pop out of some of, you know, Michael's work. Um, whoops, back up. First of all, as I said, I think I dropped the slide out, but I should have tucked it in. Michael went around to every single nursery in the U.S. that sold black raspberries, a large number of growers in Oregon and Washington sampled leaf tissue. He grounded up and fingerprinted it, and what he found is, I don't have the paper in front of me, but more or less, everything out there that's Bristol is also lumber. If you're in the east, you call it Bristol. If you're in the west, you call it lumber. And you'll see it still mark marketed the same, because you know, it's two different ones, because in the East, they've been told for 40 years that Munger's a dog and they need to plant Bristol. <laughs> Likewise, out here, we can plant Munger. I don't think we want to plant Bristol for whatever reason. And so as a result, you're going to always often see those, you know, jointly sold under both those names. But don't expect much of a difference in performance. Likewise, most of the Cumberland turned out to be Munger. Uh, and not, I mean, not most of it. It all turned out to, I believe, be Munger. There's no unique Cumberland out there. Blackhawk and Jewel to be exactly the same, which isn't surprising. If you've grown either one of them, the two biggest fruited black raspberries out there. And so, and it's not, nobody did this maliciously. It's, it's mixed up with the National Clonal Germplasm Repository. Just over time, you know, people thought they were doing the right thing, you know, getting the right samples, and we don't know whether it was mixed up 20 years ago or it may have been mixed up 60 years ago. We don't really know. Um, so, that's interesting. But there's also some of the fingerprinting that's happened chemically. Chung Min Lee's who, uh, you know, she was born in uh, Korea, so she has a particular interest in the Korean black raspberry. Many <coughs> black raspberry growers know some of your fruit ends up going over to Korea and being made into both bunja, which is the national drink of Korea. Well, they, uh, every single new, uh, research article that comes out of Korea talking about black raspberry says they've got this native one. Rubus coreanus, that's what they're using in their product, and that's what the special traditional drink has been, and that's what goes into both bunja. That's a bunch of hooey. It's almost all North American black raspberry. Now, we may not want to point up that fact in a big way, because as long as we're buying a lot of fruit and putting it into this product, that's great. But where we need to keep in mind and use it the other way is there's a whole bunch of health benefit research being done in Korea on Rubus, quote unquote, Rubus coreanus is not. It's Rubus occidentalis. It's our native, what we use. It's munger they're doing research on. So here's a cheap way that the commissions do a bunch of health benefit research. It's just by having John Min look at some of these papers because she has gone through and listed a whole bunch of papers that, based on their anthocyanin background, it's North American black raspberry that's being used in that health benefit research. So something we can somehow hopefully connect the dots in a few places. Where, although we want to make sure we don't sacrifice sales to Korea. Another thing John Min did is looked at these products. She uh, bought a number of uh, black raspberry supplements online and. Wherever, and, you know, her first thought is, I don't see how there could be much black raspberry in some of these. I mean, the light's not great here, but this is a beautiful purple. This is a beautiful purple. These don't like, like it at all. She did it totally anonymously. 
So there's no way to go back and say, okay, this is such and such a brand. But basically, these had absolutely no or very little black raspberry in there. They're being sold as black raspberry supplements. She could not find either a really small proportion or none in a couple of them. This one is great. It's, it's just as advertised. And I think this one is just as advertised. So, you know, she has been able to use that understanding of the anthocyanins of black raspberry. And what she basically did is, you know, well, this is different, but it's this kind of graph. Is, you know, you can tell which anthocyanins, excuse me, this is the, the one here, that you should have these peaks when you run it through their equipment. It doesn't have those peaks, it doesn't have any black raspberry. So, back to breeding. That's sort of all the different kinds of things we've done. In breeding, you know, I look back to my crossing. Okay. Okay. I look back to my crossing records, and this is all the crosses I did in black raspberry since 1998. So I probably did about five crosses in 98. And then what we do is we call it OP populations. That means oh, that's stuff we collected from the eastern U.S. We didn't. We don't have any idea who the male parent is. We collected fruit from all these people. We grew out the seedlings. And so here, this is obviously this is Michael's PhD work, getting them out over a couple different years. So we didn't do a whole lot of crosses this year. We had a few crosses over this year based on the performance of the first trial where we thought we were crossing different things and, and that sort of thing. And then, so we sort of have three different themes, uh, and I'll talk about these individually. You know, sort of the early phase, then sort of when we're working with a lot of this Michael's PhD work, and then what we've done the last couple of years. So these general breeding efforts. First one was based on the, the earlier uh, evaluations, the first ones we did in Michael's master's thesis where he looked at variability, we made crosses amongst a lot of parents and we got selections. And this was really where most of the things we have now in grower trial came from. It came out of this kind of research. Now what we're finding is we thought we were crossing jewel by, well, if we were crossing jewel by Munger, that's pretty accurate. But if we were crossing jewel by Cumberland, we were probably just crossing, well, excuse me, Cumberland by Munger was probably the equivalent of crossing Munger by Munger. Um, so we, we, we've gotten some things that we're excited about, but we still have a ways to go. Then we have all this material that we grew out of Michael's thesis, these hundreds of popula or 175 populations. We made selections from those. Some of those may actually be cultivars. A lot of them are going to be too small fruited, or in case of the wonderful populations from the southeast that appear to have verticillium tolerance, they tend to be purple instead of black. Not purple, but not a really dark black. So they've got some problems, and they're pretty small. And then, now that we started to understand the aphid resistance and some of the disease tolerance, we started to make those crosses. But really, you know, those kinds of things are just coming along. So, you know, the, the ones that, you know, the numbers we've made, I just sort of talked about that. We have a number of selections that are being propagated for grower trials. I missed one slide that I'll, I remember to talk about after the fourth one here. But we have several selections that Tom is working on getting these out into trial for machine harvest. But this is coming out of the first group before we knew any better about the parentage. It's not that they're not good, but it's still, we're learning. And we've learned. And so the, there's a couple, uh, this one, 3409, it's available from the nurseries um, from North American Plant, and I think uh, some others, but especially North American Plant. Um, this one may be mostly a fresh market one because it does have a pretty significant fall crop, uh, but it also has a good summer crop. Oh, here's the one I thought I left up. This is 3735-3. This is a really large fruited one. Um, it's sort of a jewel side thing, but I think it lives longer than jewel. So this is one, if you're doing fresh market, you'd want to try. We are putting, we do have it out in a small machine harvest row that we'll harvest next year. So we Michael, Michael and I sort of have a bet. He doesn't think this is machine harvestable, and I think it's got possibility of machine harvesting. So we'll see who's right this summer. Um, really nice berry, um, and but with these selections, what we're finding is, you know, the goal is to have something that lives a lot longer than munger. Well, at least you know, maybe the maybe it lives twice as long as munger would be a good start. And some of these are probably going to live one or two years longer than munger. But they, make, they aren't the answer I want of something that's back to 10 years longer than Munger. But as somebody pointed out with another crop I was working with, that these things are twice the yield of Munger, even if they don't live any longer, that's a plus. So uh, just because they're not meeting our longevity goal, if we can get greater yield, that's, that's a good thing. And so that's what some of these have. We have these two selections. We ran a machine over them last year in, in our trial. They seem to come off very well. Um, this is ones that yields are much higher than Munger. Uh, machine well, chemistry looks good. 
And so we've got a few of these going out in the trial, but there's all of the button. We'll get to the button in a minute. Here's a few of them to look at as uh, Northwest Food Processors put out. This isn't a great slide, especially here today, but uh, they look good, they're promising. But then I took, I think uh, this was, I'm not sure if it was 2012 or 13, I think it was 2012 uh, evaluation we do in Corvallis where everybody comes down and says, sort of like, a little like you did today, only not as detailed. It's a huge number. You know, is this excellent? Is it, I'm not sure about it, or a discard? Well, here's Munger, one Munger and the second Munger. And they're definitely, I guess they have the purple arrows, they're you know, up here at the top in both cases. A lot of things way down here. And then you look at our selections, and it's good that this one's up here. This one might be okay, because these are sort of not really formal trials. But you start getting down here, and you start to wonder whether some of these are really going to hold up with the fruit quality we need to replace Munger. Uh, you look at some of these over a couple different years, I guess this is 12 and 13, and you got Munger here and Munger here, and the good news is, we've got some things up here. The bad news is, some of our, uh, you know, this is one of our selections, that's good to see up here, but some of our selections are starting to drop off down here. You know, I'm not sure that's going to work. It's good to get it out and trial in larger quantities, but it may not have the flavor for products you're selling where flavor is very important as opposed to just the colorant. You know, these may not be the answer. So that's that's what we're juggling. Um, then, you know, now we're sort of growing out the populations collected by Michael, and we've started to evaluate the selections. And these are sort of the things you might have seen in the commission reports this year. Just the big arrow is just sort of comparing where a munger would have fit. This is replicated. This is single plot. Replicated single plot. It's just showing that, you know, the good news is, is munger is at the bottom here. Not necessarily statistically distant, different. And if you were to sort of compare it, it's not fair to stick it in there, but it's in the lower third of the plantings. Uh, so pretty confident that all of these up here are higher yielding than munger. Some of them have big fruits, you know, comparable to munger, and some of them are, you know, fairly small fruit. Uh, this 4115 is verticillium resistant, but look at the fruit side, and you hate to see it at this part of the ground. See the same thing over here, where munger, you know, there's some better than munger, but uh, munger's bottom third up here, and, but it's not as bad here. Now we'll see if this holds up this year. This was a first year harvest, um, and some of these things I think will hold up in the year, second year better than Munger would, but we'll see. So the good news is, from a breeder standpoint, is the yield is not going to be the problem for replacing Munger, I don't think. It's going to be machine harvestability. It's going to be adaptation, disease resistance. Then, now we're starting to really start to cross the aphid resistant and disease resistant material. You know, we're going through some of what Michael did before. We're hoping to find the markers quickly. But, you know, we have them out in seedling fields, and we'll be evaluating a lot of these this coming summer and start to get some of these things that should have good aphid resistance in them. With that, it sort of tells you the picture. This is the day I went out unprepared. <laughs> Turns out Joe Tankersley can grow some monster black raspberries in one year. And expected to go out and see little plants, so we might have to talk a little bit. And uh, I had shorts, and which I usually have. I luckily found a pair of gloves in the truck, but it was a scarring experience getting those things back under control for this trial. Does anybody have any questions about what we've done? What's the, uh, what's the time frame you're thinking about on this stuff? It's, are you five, ten years away from For what? <laughs> That's what I, my point is. We will have, I think, by the time we go through this grower trial, I think we'll have things that are higher yielding and longer and at least slightly longer lived, whether that's one or two years more, and whether we have fruit quality or not, we'll have to see. That's pretty easy. And I think that, well, we'll probably release this 3735-3 very quickly, because I don't know if it's going to machine harvest, but I think it's got a place in the fresh market as a large fruit fresh. So that's basically under 10 years from, like, where you really started developing this stuff, Yeah, right? yeah. But having some of these ones that are you know, have greater longevity, you know, hopefully because we have things in place, you know, the trial things, we can get these things uh, up to speed. It's never going to be as fast as everybody wants, but then as soon as you release it fast, you're like, whoa, wait a second, we don't know enough about it. You know, so it's, you know, it's a to challenge. Other questions? Chad, what, what's the cost of your program per year to do all of that? It's a tremendous amount of work. I'm just curious. Uh, it depends on what you add in there. Uh, it depends on whose budget. You, I mean, it's, it's it's over half a million a year, certainly overall. Not 
black raspberries. I don't know, I can't parse that out. But if you look at what the USDA pays for our research program, it's probably about $450,000 a year, and you probably got close to 100 grand in between what goes to Barnaby to help support our program and goes to me, close to 100 grand. And then you throw in the, uh, we, we're really, we're dogs for money. We go after grants wherever we can, and we've been pretty successful. I mean, the, the SCRI grant was a $3.3 .3 million grant, not all of which comes here. I wish it did. It's more like, but it is $60,000 a year coming here to do black raspberry research that we wouldn't have otherwise. But it's, it's, it's a lot of money. But for our region for black raspberries, we're the only region that's got a processing industry, or is there significant no. processing other places? Well, Smuckers has got some sort of acreage. I don't know, anybody from Smuckers here wants to, I mean, there's a certain amount in Ohio. And, uh, but I think it's concentrated one or two growers there. At one time, it was close to 600 acres, but I don't think it's been anything like that. I think it's. Uh, What's our acreage here? <laughs> Well, the, we've got the stats right there, and uh, it, you know it seems to usually vary from low 1,200 up to 1,600. I mean, this is our economic problem right here. If, if you, if it could really change the whole game if we get. We get some higher yields, but then the, no, the no, market's got a hollow too. But we'll, we'll that, go that there. Right. I, I don't worry too much about that. I mean, I mean, not that it doesn't take development or whatever, but if you can. If we can get a stable price of black raspberries, that's something that makes money for the growers and smuckers and the rest think it's acceptable or however that balance is, you always have that tension. But somewhere between there, everybody's happy, then I think we'll take off. Have you run any of these new varieties to smuckers or anybody for? No, that's, what, what will hopefully happen is by putting the plant out through the crop program, we will get, you know, 100, 100 plants in different locations that will be machine harvest that can be pushed into uh, um, the system. We do have um, five selections that we have. Uh, how many people grow up or guilt take off? Um, probably, yeah, we have about 20, 40 plants for that we'll be harvesting this year that some of them we've already discarded for other reasons, but they're part of a genetic study, and some are still in the system. So we should be able to get a little bit of fruit from that this summer. Well, and I know Don is going to get, you, know, you had the machine harvested trials, or larger trials up there with this stuff, and you're one of our main sites. We haven't gotten the big stuff numbers up there, we should this year, like 100 plants or so per trial. And then I think Riverbend is going to get some and uh, OBPI, I don't know. If any of you guys are interested in that, we don't have big numbers. And these are kind of, I feel like they're preliminary yet, like people are going to get their hopes up and get disappointed if we get too far ahead of ourselves, too. Yeah. Um, the but, risk, we just don't know. We right. can't get much more disappointed than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, people are still planning it to make money on it. So. Yeah. Uh, well, any other? Burning questions, otherwise, let's do chat again.